guys, this is Vivek and welcome to episode 13 of Dead Horse Podcast. Uh, with me are my co-hosts uh, Arvind. Hello. And Tejas. Hello. So this week we're, we're going to discuss roguelikes considering that they have been the kind of the de- design trend that has dominated PC games at least for the last for this last year almost. I'd say we've seen a lot of roguelikes come out, roguelikes, FTL, stuff like that. Uh, so I'll start with Tejas. Uh, I think Tejas is the one who's played the most FTL amongst all of us here. Yes. So, yeah. Like, let's talk about uh, designing roguelikes and you know how roguelike elements are starting to permeate all kinds of games now. Well, I, I think uh, before I get into that, I should mention that because roguelikes, you know, probably is the same thing right now. Uh, Arvind, maybe you should turn unrest into a bit of a roguelike just to tap into that market. You know, like just really mm-hmm. get more people interested in it. I mean, it already has a bit of that, but like. Uh, if you die, then the story continues from that point. Instead <laughs> of, so it already has a bit of that. So, right. So now all you need are randomly generated uh, levels, right? And uh, maybe some uh, uh, really cool weapon upgrades and a really, really sweet combat system. It already happens. Like, uh, like the game, like the marketing is all focused on ancient India, but but it next time you spawn in ancient China, and then the next time you spawn in <laughs> Uh, I don't know the the star the black planet from Star Wars with all the sand. Yeah. Right, Tatooine. Yeah, that one. Yeah, Tatooine. Yeah, see, now that would make a kick-ass game. <laughs> but uh, yeah, come back to uh, what I think really works for uh, for Roblox. I believe it's uh, just you know like when you have a good. Uh, good set of you know mini stories that you can tell by yourself so it could be like just really good combat encounters that uh, last long enough with enough uh, you know turns in between each uh, strike for it to become like something that you can weave a story out of or you know kind of like what FTL does right now where it's just um, you know they have good stories in and of themselves and the combat makes it just better so i think that's like for me that's core is just you know the stories that start to develop with the way you play a game. Cool. One of the key things about roguelikes that I find super interesting is permadeath. And I think that's what makes them compelling. I think that's what makes uh, the characters that you play in them super compelling. I think uh, like this year, a game that implemented permadeath in its way, uh, like permadeath was pretty much the core of the design of Rogue Legacy, which I played the crap out of. I'm still playing the crap out of. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Rogue Legacy, for those who don't know, you play a hero who's trying to get to the heart of this castle so that they can find a cure for their father who's been poisoned by an assassin's blade. Right. And uh, when you die, the next person in your line uh, goes on the same quest. And uh, all the money you've accum- accumulated during your quest carries over to them so they can spend it on upgrading. Like They, may- they can have better weapons, they can buy... Uh, upgrades to their like skill trees and stuff like that before they go out to fight. Essentially, the the kind of system that it develops is you start calculating uh, how much like each life becomes valuable in the sense that you know that all right, fine, this character is about to die. Let me try and get as much as much money as possible before they die. Right. So you you each life in like in terms of what can I make out of this? So as individuals. You don't value the characters that much, but as a whole, like they all add up more and more to like you know your big quest to take over this castle. Yeah, uh, I, I think I agree with the permadeath being a key feature for these, is because when you know that you know you have to uh, start over or start at the beginning again, uh, it adds a lot of uh, it adds so much more meaning to what you're doing. You know, if if you know that yeah, I'll die, I'll just you know. Uh, hit, uh, uh, reload my save, then, yeah. you know, the, the, a lot of that tension is gone. A lot of that, uh, the decision, you know, where the decision becomes like, okay, should I really do this or not is more meaningful. Whereas, you know, if you had a save game that you could uh, fall back to, it's more experimentation where, okay, let me just try doing this. If it works out, yeah. good. if not, I'll yeah. just, you know, try something else. And, you know, that that sort of gameplay has you know its merits, but you know it does take away uh, uh, getting uh, getting someone to like really think about something and really feel you know amazing they uh, chose the right decision or really shit when they didn't. Yeah, yeah. I think that 
to a large degree roguelikes are not built for people who enjoy min maxing yeah uh, because mm-hmm. yeah because it's, it's very decision uh, it's, also like they often deal you a very unfair hand like sometimes the level generator fucks you up and sometimes yeah, it's sure. like so yeah so it's more of a case of uh, roguelikes are uh, they have something of that uh, like daisy feel to them where it's like you are surviving against a system that hates you and you are getting mm-hmm. the better of it eventually yeah i think it's definitely something that uh, the kind of player who enjoys beating games so that they can say they beat a game uh like you know the, the, those kind of players will like to play roguelikes but if you enjoy just uh s- like specking out your character min maxing like getting the just the right character with the right equipment you're going to hate roguelikes because uh, <laughs> your character is going to die a lot <laughs> and uh, like you know you like that attachment that you have will feel worthless but at the same time for players who enjoy that kind of game i think uh, it it really changes the way you play you value each uh, play through a lot more and you think a lot more before you make a decision and that changes your play style right yeah yeah and i mean that they are the kind of uh, like often times like you have people who uh, like you know there is a, a problem where like people don't finish games and all that stuff i don't i think that's a problem which rogue likes uh, like have a lot because like it's it's very yeah. rare i have gotten to the end of a rogue like like i have i have finished fpl once with a ship <laughs> yeah with that ship the the in, improved cruiser and i just right. blasted yeah. all of that i have not been able to uh, finish fpl with any of the other ships like i always die at the end boss okay have you uh, were you playing on easy or normal i was playing on normal yeah okay like i was actually uh, in that shape thing i started out with easy but then the game sort of became too easy by the third or fourth sector so yeah. i started again on normal but even then it did that improved the lines cruiser mm-hmm. get, like the game was still very easy so i don't know what it, what it was with that ship like i am obviously talking about way book way before lots of patches and stuff but i don't okay. know that ship was just maybe i got a great weapon or something i'm not sure but or maybe you just got lucky because that's you know always possible yeah yeah i mean i remember i had a anti uh, attack drone which like which defends you and stuff right and right. like i had lots of missiles in that one so yeah, maybe that's cool <laughs> yeah also also another interesting like, game this year uh, and i would say that in certain it uses a lot of rogue like uh, design elements in it is a uh, state of decay i don't know if you guys have played it uh but state of decay is like a zombie survival zombie apocalypse game you play a survivor and every time you die you uh like you, that the character that you have leveled up and played is dead and you have to play as a new character in that world and i think that's it it makes the game really interesting because you like the leveled up character that you have with leveled up equipment sometimes you lose that character entirely and you lose even the equipment that they have whoa <laughs> so yeah I, that's again that's an interesting take i i i think that this year we're seeing all sorts of genres trying to do more mixing and matching than just the standard uh, you know adding rpg elements to your multiplayer which has become a very standard fps thing yeah. and it's stuck everywhere we're seeing more interesting uh, hybrid hybrids in terms of design i think this is think a, a a great thing of like of because we have so many indie games so each developer has to uh focus on standing out from everyone else yeah for sure and uh so we've you've been playing uh, a lot of uh, spelunky recently too tell us about that is spelunky a roguelike yeah it is as yeah it is it like yeah start, start from the beginning spelunky is probably in terms of control design and combat design one of the most tightly designed games i have ever played like <laughs> that game uh, to be good at it it requires precision at almost like a pixel level Like you need to know exactly when to hit the right button so that you can get through a level in the like you know the fastest possible pace uh it is yeah it is designed for like high precision platforming players who know exactly what they're doing <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it's a very is, weird combination uh, to take that and combine it with a roguelike uh yeah. but i mean again the decisions in spelunky that you make you bang your head on a wall sometimes 
because you went left instead of right. Uh, <laughs> your life. And then uh, Spelunky has the added, uh, like it has the added goal to do things like, you know, in, like insert levels in which you cannot see unless you're carrying around a torch. And that just makes your life so much worse. Uh, uh, yeah, because I, mean, I for when I was playing Spelunky, I just hit a brick wall in terms of like pure re- reflexes at the last temple level. So I could reliably yeah. uh, start from level one and then reach the first temple level. But after that, it just became uh, like too too much of a crapshoot for me. So so I stopped playing. But yeah, like it is I like I got- in terms of I still just uh, like. When I'm in that mood where I don't really want to put an effort into playing a game, you know, just playing something that feels comfortable, they often just boot up Spelunky for no reason because it's just <laughs> that, uh, like, it's just so comfortable to play. It is. It is comfortable to play, but like, I think that comfort lasts only to a certain extent. You know, it's fun yeah. to play. It's a lot of fun to play, but once you start getting to the ice, the ice caves. That's yeah. when the the head banging like like that's when the frustration begins. According sure, to sure, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, I am most usually like what I do is uh, when I'm bored is like I'll I'll play Spelunky and I'll say I, I I will always sprint. I will never let go of the sprint button. And then sometimes <laughs> I'm like, uh, so I won't use any bombs. Or sometimes I'm like I don't I won't use any ropes. In fact, I rarely use ropes for some reason because a lot of the levels are going downwards, so I really get stuck. But yeah. So I think, that yeah, which, uh, like you can set challenges for yourself uh, beyond what the game has to say. So yeah, impose for sure. limitations on yourself and stuff like that. Yeah, you can set it up so that well, you can't set it up so that, but you can say you're not going to use more than one bomb or level, and if you stick to that, it makes the game a lot harder. The self-imposed restrictions, like playing Spelunky and like even playing a game like Far Cry 2, like that, you know, wherein you yeah. say. You're going to play it permanently, wherein if you die, you're dead. Uh, it changes the way you play that game a lot. Far Cry is an interesting game because, like, <laughs> people who just uh, like play games conventionally are like, ah, this is a... and they, like even personally, I'm not a big fan of it because it's just it just felt too much. Uh, like I was I was feeling like why did why did I pay money to play this game? It should have been the other way around. I should pay a salary <laughs> oh. for playing. This. But. But yeah, no, not because it's bad in such a way. It's just so, it's just so uh, like it's suffocating. Like, that game is like you uh, feel like you are actually <laughs> in a very oppressive environment and like in a very dangerous place when playing it. Yeah, for sure. That and uh, the the getting from point A to point B is very clunky in that game. The driving, yeah, especially with the respawning stuff. Like you just go yeah. there and like within five minutes you want to go back and everyone is. Responded. That that being said, like in terms of designing a world that feels, uh, like uh, like you said, like a world that feels that it's alive and it, it is everything in it wants to kill you. I think you you don't get it any better than Far Cry 2. That world feels dangerous. Uh, yeah, and it feels suffocating at times. I think it's a, it's it has this thing where, like with which is like with every Ubisoft game, is that if you. Often, too, you think like if you could combine two Ubisoft games, it would just be the best game ever. But like, <laughs> so Far Cry 3 has some very great things with the collectibles going on. And like, yeah. I'm talking about Blood Dragon. I haven't played the actual Far Cry. Three. And it has okay. a very nice aesthetic. Visually, it's very pleasing to look and it's, it has that whole retro vibe. But then, like, Far Cry 2 has this thing the world building and like the, the yeah. down. But some of those things are just too. Clunky, so it's the same. It's it's like you know, if you could combine Sands of Time and the Two Thrones, it would be like the the one game that anyone ever needs to play. It's just like <laughs> that's what Ubisoft does. They just make these games which are like so. You think just this little bit would would have made it so much? Yeah, yeah. would make it from a good game. It would make it a great game. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, like I think one thing. Uh, uh, getting the discussion back to roguelikes, I think one thing about roguelikes that I've always found fascinating in terms of, uh, especially in terms of design, is that people tend to get a lot more attached to their characters in a roguelike than they are ever attached to characters that they're, that you know, that are written and that have stories behind them. Uh, you know, like, uh, it I is... I don't think uh, that's the case. I think what actually happens is that everyone has 
uh, a few characters that they are very attached to in a game that's like you know I, I think... stories be written like uh, for example garas many people love yeah. garas but like but the other main reason people love their characters in like roguelikes or xcom is that like there is the slightest chance that they might survive and that means I, I, I that believe means the word though is them. not sorry arvind uh, uh what i was saying i believe the word isn't uh, attachment but rather memorable that you know just moments are more memorable as compared to you know uh more focused games which are you know uh well, they're built around getting you to care about someone but you care about yeah. uh rather kind of the narrative of the character but not like these moments you, i mean you never look back and say oh remember this time when i was playing assassin's creed when this really one cool thing happened i mean maybe once or twice but you don't have like as many uh stories as those as you have with a rogue like yeah but i think i think the key reason behind that is because for uh, roguelikes especially uh the everything that happens feels spontaneous it doesn't feel like this is something a designer set up for me to have yeah, that's it's because the, the system thing. that it, uh, like even with games like gta or saints row uh, if you have this awesome pre scripted mo- moment you you probably just laugh about it maybe talk about it once at max yeah. but because but you but in the end every person who played that game had that exact same experience like that saints row uh, four thing where it's like you defuse that bomb that rocket and you fall down into the us president chair so i mean it's, it's pretty fun but ultimately every single player that played that game had that so it doesn't have that uniqueness to it whereas if if you execute some really complex uh, thing in xcom or something so then you are like yes this is something i did which nobody else has done or at least like nobody else that i know has done yeah you feel like you have more agency essentially yeah. you feel like th- this is some this is something that you did that had an effect on the world that you are playing in and that's yeah again that hits on the other thing i want to talk about is persistence in role like world although because of permadeath you don't feel like you had an effect on the world but if you look at games that have come out recently like don't starve uh those words are persistent until your character dies every action that you've taken in the world has had an effect on that world and i think again that's the other thing that makes like that kind of game a it's it those kind of games are difficult to make roguelikes are not easy to to make they take a lot of iteration they take a lot of they're buggy games largely like and none of them are bug free but the key thing is when you when you are playing in a world where you know you can directly see that you are affecting change uh yeah I, like it makes the experience feel more like vivid i suppose yeah yeah it it makes it makes uh i uh, vivid and it also kind of just you know makes you feel like you're part of it like you're affecting things instead of just you know uh being a participant you know just like someone who's uh being handheld along a story or uh you know just watching someone else's story play out this feels uh much more involved yeah all right let's just just as a thought experiment try and uh, think of like what kind of game would you mix with roguelike elements or what kind of game would you like to see in the coming year that had roguelike ele- roguelike elements in it Or what kind of game would you guys like to make that had roguelike roguelike oh, elements? Oh, oh, you, you know what would be perfect? Just to troll <laughs> the world, Call of Duty with permadeath. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird because, uh, like, in the single player, I'm pretty sure you die for like every one hour or so. Exactly. That would be an even shorter single player Call of Duty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so as soon as like as soon as you begin. you know you know you're going to die and then they're going to kill you anyways <laughs> yeah and the best part is that you cannot even stop it because if you stop and the other other characters move so uh, slightly further ahead then the game over screen pops up and you are killed anyway <laughs> so it's the shortest thing ever it'll this perfect uh, we need to get this done we should totally pitch no, it i actually to think uh, like having some sort of uh, <clears throat> like you know with the just cause 2 multiplayer thing 
having yeah. slight rogue like elements and all in that would be exciting so so like everyone is rico rodriguez and everyone is holding their weapons and all that stuff uh, and like at the same time uh, but but yeah and if you kill somebody you take all of this stuff and at the same time uh, you could have some sort of uh, base building or like individual homes in that kind of thing i'm not sure how that would be executed even but i just thought you know what would be best with rogue likes just cause two so <laughs> <laughs> yeah sounds sounds different at least yeah i want to i want to make a banner saga rogue like yeah oh shit dude is it oh, so oh i thought banner saga already had that for some reason no no it doesn't uh, in the oh. banner saga uh, if if someone dies during a fight they don't die banner saga deaths occur only during dialogue sequences no oh, okay former death occurs only during dialogue sequences okay oh, so wow. if your soldiers die they just get knocked out for that battle or something yeah they are they are injured and it takes rest for a certain amount of days to cure them based on how badly they are injured oh okay 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 so that kind of makes sense yeah. yeah so yeah like i mean i think because they designed what was kind of a tough combat system where in the new people were going to die in battle they didn't want to make that uh, death permanent because they yeah. didn't want people to end up with just one person in the like later on battles because yeah yeah that's that a problem yeah mm-hmm. that that would be like problematic right so because especially because in their system right now you cannot uh, well okay the banner saga is basically two games one game in which you are ma- managing uh, a caravan that is coming with you and you have to manage the supplies of that caravan and you've got to solve the problems that crop up it's kind of re- reminiscent of expeditions conquistador or in that aspect okay. uh, wherein like, there will be arguments that crop up between people in your expedition uh, between people in your caravan and you have to sort them out uh, and your uh, and the other aspect is combat wherein you, you like you know you have encounters with brigands you have encounters with uh, these you have encounters with the enemies in the game and the dredge they're called and uh, you have to get past those encounters Okay. So death occurs during the portion when you're traveling. People can die because if you don't have supplies, they'll die of starvation. But none of those deaths will be main characters. They will be just be people in your caravan randomly dying. So it doesn't feel real. So like if you can do uh, like a mixture of something like a game like Myth. Uh, I don't know if you guys have played Myth. Myth is an old bungee strategy game in which. Uh, yeah. your your soldiers from the first mission carried over to the last mission so if any of them died they were dead forever oh wow and it's like home so world. that was your army for the entire single player campaign the army that you found in the beginning and some soldiers you could recruit it later on but like your army in the first mission is your army that is weird there. for an rts because like half of the uh, like rts game in fact is just Uh, starting from one base and expanding and uh, all that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. In myth, there's no ba- base building. It is basically you're managing an uh, like, especially in the single player campaign, there's no base building. You're managing oh. this uh, band of soldiers as they move through this very dangerous like space. That is yeah. essentially the myth, and that is the those are the tactics behind. Like you have to essentially use these soldiers in a way that like the maximum number survive in each encounter. So if, if I think if the banner saga had done something like that wherein the parties were smaller you don't have 4 or 500 people with you you have 30 people but you know who each of those 30 people are like I think that becomes a much more uh like the stakes get a lot higher so when someone dies of starvation you feel the pinch of that right right mm-hmm. or when someone dies in combat you, like that's another thing that you, that really hits home It, it's actually so, there is a death there is a death in the banner saga in combat but i won't spoil it no okay it's it's kind but of now like I know, world. but now i know that there is a death yeah <laughs> it's semi uh, spoiled you don't know that it's halfway through the game wait <laughs> shit <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I was, I said, oh sorry go ahead no go ahead oh uh, no i was saying it's like home world you know you begin the game and yeah. like every time the first like the first playthrough you know you play like a normal rts and then the second mission begins and you're like oh shit but you know that point onwards you you really pay attention you know uh, suicide runs are like you know just just something that you don't want to do 
unless it's like you know you have no other option but you you you're careful with your ships you you know try and uh, make sure everyone survives you you know you keep an eye on things and you know that's nice to see in an rts too you know where everything's not just something that has to be killed you know they're not just a set of numbers but rather you know re uh, like meaningful resources that you want to you know save for later uh, like just speaking of the banner saga again, uh, like it, another thing that does really well is making you feel like the world is a very, very bleak and uh, dangerous place. Like I think the banner saga does that really well, especially because almost everywhere you go, no one is happy to see you. <laughs> every every person you meet in that game is like, oh, you're here, fantastic. Uh, and yeah, like they do a really good job of conveying that this is the world that you're in. And like, I want to take that aspect of a, a world which has lore and a setting and take that and in, in put in, uh, you know, uh, like the roguelike elements of, you know, permadeath and a very, very well-tuned combat system. Yep. Yeah, that would be nice okay. to see. Yeah, but yeah. the main problem with, uh, like in some extent to like the hypothetical question, how would you add roguelikes to uh, certain games is that many games have already started adding it so yeah yeah I, uh, I think uh, the major worry this year that a lot of people have is that everything is going to become a roguelike now uh, uh, because it's we're going to see we might see a call of duty roguelike and that would be horrible i think uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> if we see a call of duty roguelike i you know i would play it i would most definitely play that yeah, I mean, it's another that 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 problem, you know, where it's like, what what is even a rogue like? Because like, it's like in some cases, it's you know, with RPGs, it's like, uh, like it's hard to say because there's so many variations. So I wonder if that, I mean, to a certain extent, already, but yeah, because even the genesis of the term is kind of weird because it's like like a rogue, which is, <laughs> which doesn't have much in common with uh, rogue likes yeah. today. I think if you take a look at uh, like Call of Duty, for example, I think in that, if your if your soldier died, you'd have to just like they'd have to do the state of decay thing, where if the soldier you're playing as dies, you just you pop into another soldier, and like you have to keep going until the entire squad is wiped out. That would be interesting, where you have like a finite have squad, to do something like that. Call of Duty, it cannot be every time you die, you start from the beginning because that would make people want to murder the devs. <laughs> But it, I like the idea that you know you have a finite squad, and actually it'd be a, it'd be a really cool thing where you you lead them and you give them positions. Oh shit, this is very. It's like a Republic Commando. You have a small squad. You you know you're leading everyone, and if you die or someone else dies, it, it's a major loss. Yeah, yeah. Especially if that squad has to like carry on to further missions and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but yeah, I doubt that'll ever happen in a Call of Duty game. Persistence is not their strong suit. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, have uh, uh, have you guys seen the the trailer for the new uh, Lord of the Rings game, uh, Shadow over Mordor? Yeah, yeah there's that, like a that one that trailer that came looks today, like right? Assassin's Creed, like button. Yeah, that that's what everyone's saying, and yeah, it does look like Assassin's Creed. But my point is actually that the Nemesis system, which is actually pretty cool. Now, what if we make this Republic Commando thing with, uh, you know, uh, permadeath, and we use that nemesis system to get new squad mates if people die, and the ones who exist call out <laughs> shit that you fucked up with earlier? How awesome would that be? Like, uh, the thing about that nemesis thing is, like, I'm not sure just how exactly, uh, how broad exactly would it be because like it could just be that it's just like four or five enemies in the game that have but yeah like i'm i'm interested but ultimately i think this is one of those cases where if it was set in an original setting i would probably be more more intrigued because my mind has already just uh, half of my mind is like a eh, lot of the rings enough is enough come on and has already put it into the like ignore bin and it's uh, and on top of that, like Assassin's Creed is not exactly an underutilized franchise as well, right? It's like you get a new Assassin's Creed every what is it now? Like year, six every months? Year. I'm not even sure. Every year. Yeah, though, like they have this Assassin's Creed Liberation now, right? Which is 
So that is the that's just an up, uh, update, right? That's an HD version of a PS Vita game. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's still pretty close to Black Flag. So it's uh, it's like six months since Black Flag, right? Six months maybe or three yeah, months. Yeah, I, su- I suppose you could say that. Uh, but that being said, Black Flag was a good game after a long time. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's just like it's a combination of it's like somebody said, okay, what what are the things that every game is being is being tired of apart from first person shooters? Let's put all of that in one game, and add this one interesting system <laughs> called Nemesis to it. I don't know, it just feels like that. Maybe I'm being too uh, cynical, but yeah. Cynical? You think you're being too cynical? An Assassin's Creed 2 dev tweeted that uh, uh, Shadows of Mordor is using yeah. Assassin's Creed. Assets and code. <laughs> yeah, what? I read that. How, how is that even possible? Like, it's yeah, it should not be possible because this is a Warner Brothers game. If they're using code from Assassin's Creed Two and assets from Assassin's Creed Two, that's, that's lost. I mean, a big lawsuit. You can take people to court for that. So I don't know. It may be a dev who's just pissed off yeah. because he saw something similar. Uh, yeah. Because and the games are. Yeah. How- Developer know whether the code is same. I mean, it's not like Assassin's Creed has some uh, like. I mean, it does have some really neat stuff. Don't get me wrong, but like, it doesn't really do anything like, like you know, Rage for example. Where you like, you can just see and say, okay, yeah, this is the a different technology. Yeah, yeah mega textures. Yeah. I mean, even with Rage, like you could only tell it was mega textures because you move around slightly and the game just blurs a little bit. <laughs> So well, I, mean, I don't know I... where the developer found out that the like how would you even know if like if something was using your like, I don't think I don't think you can know I think he's I think he's just blowing off steam uh, because if that was the case I think Ubisoft would blow a gasket <laughs> yeah uh, anyway I think that ends our discussion on roguelikes more or less unless you guys have something new to add no uh, no nothing no all right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, this is something that everybody knows about, but apparently the word candy and the word saga are now trademarked. Did you know that, guys? Yes, saga is oh, actually really? suspended, so I don't even know why King are doing that. But like, Candy Crush Saga and Candy are what are, what has been copyrighted. This the copyright on Saga has been suspended, I think. Yeah, like, it was never granted in the first place. Over. The single okay, that saga hasn't been done yet. There, uh, you know, there uh, people. Uh, the thing with Stoic basically is that, uh, you know, they've uh, petitioned to like halt that. But the thing is, the Banner Saga also had tried to uh, trademark their full name, and uh, King.com uh, blocked that uh, trademark as well. So there's a lot of yeah. back and forth on this. Yeah, 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 like specifically King.com is saying they have no problem with the Banner Saga calling itself the Banner Saga. They have no problem with it using the word Saga in the title. They don't want someone else to have a trademark with the word Saga in it. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, they do have a problem with the Banner so. Saga. I mean, no, 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 they don't have. A, huh? They don't have a problem with the title. They don't want them to take to stop using the title. They don't want them to be able to trademark the Banner Saga. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Those are two separate things. You use whatever you want to sell your game. That's fine. Don't just, take it. I huh? mean, and aren't they just uh, like sending no, cease and to everyone? I mean, Rock Paper Shotgun had an article about this, right? Yeah, Where... I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I think they're doing yeah. this. Because if someone can trademark a game with Saga in the name, what a lawyer can do is say, I will call my game Candy Cane Saga. And you can't say anything because someone's already trademarked the game with Saga in the name. No, I think that that's a wrong. Like there was a like there was so, a particle link which was uh, said said that like it doesn't actually mean that you need to uh, copyright all. But, like it doesn't mean that if somebody else's trademarks is trademarks that little thing, that it means that your trademark is invalid. It's more of a case by case thing. The only case where it, it is invalidated is if, like, you can conclusively prove that everything, uh, like multiple people, have have done that, and you did not take any action against it. Ah, uh, well, then in this case, it would be multiple people, right? I think this is more of a case of like king, uh, like just doing what they can because, like, you know, 
like who yeah, has the money I to stop them so could be that as well because like this is the i'll tell you why i'm t- saying this because this was the argument that bethesda made when they wanted notch to not call his games scrolls you know yeah. they did not want the word scrolls to be used and they didn't want him to be able to trademark scrolls yeah. because the next guy can come out with a game calling it older scrolls and say hey when notch came out with scrolls you didn't say anything yeah but in the end they did have a an agreement right because i think it, it oh, yeah, is they, called they, they, they did an agreement of some sort i don't know what it was but it was like a one time agreement so that everybody gets out without looking mm-hmm. like a dick uh, that's because bethesda is probably a smarter company than king.com like i think if if you are a game developer and another game developer has something similar you talk to them like you get in touch with them developer to developer as opposed yeah. to sending them a this is also wire. that thing right with with wasteland kings like brian fargo contacted those guys vilam v they had named their game wasteland kings but now it's called nuclear throne so, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah they changed it because he's like we're coming out of wasteland 2 and it's confusing yeah so yeah so I mean, but, yeah i think it's just it's down to like not smart thinking by the king guys and it's given them horrible publicity especially the trademark on stuff like candy that's absurd you can't trademark like common english words yeah yeah i mean and and think about uh, the last time somebody did that like tim langdell with edge and i mean this was one guy who did not even have active game development stuff think of how long king could stretch this trademark, trademark. like yeah. it, this could be like 20 years after people have stopped playing candy crush saga Langdell went after so many people na huh? yeah he went With after the- magazines he went after games and like a bunch of other stuff and he had this really like like fake looking website it like, coming soon and all of that stuff <laughs> so, yeah. i mean the problem here is that like like what you know like cliffy b cliffy b tweeted like if if epic had to mark years of war or like war then suddenly it's like the total war developers are in trouble and you know all of that stuff so i i don't know like ultimately i don't think this is a positive thing for to trademark no, especially not. i mean you you can okay you have already trademark candy crush saga and you know stuff so you can say okay this is it but then you are just uh, extending that to general sounding names so i'm not sure i mean and uh, and like lots of developers have games called saga and with candy in them so i don't know like what yeah i don't know it's not the smartest bit of uh, yeah no no one looks well uh, the stoic guys come out of this looking great but uh, the king guys i don't know this is, seems like very bad pr by them i don't know like there's probably someone the, there the right now the problem is yelling the problem is no getting who plays kings games gives a shit about games press like yeah like every person i, I know who plays candy crush saga does not bother to even click Google game journalism or something. Yeah, forget yeah, actually absolutely. visiting sites and stuff. Yeah. I was going to point out the same is that the people who like actually give a shit are the people uh, who wouldn't go near Candy Crush and the people who should be caring about this or could you know could affect King in a way that they may you know reconsider doing this wouldn't know wouldn't really care. Yeah, and even if they did know, I don't think they'd care. Uh, yeah. It means nothing to them. For yeah. them, it's just yeah, you know, like I mean, it's not it's not something that they should care about technically, right? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, this is a company that's making like what ten million dollars per day or something. Yeah, so yeah. They, they have a... like right now they are in that phase which Zynga was two years ago yeah. or one year ago. Yeah, yeah. They're in the they've hit the sweet spot farm bill phase that Zynga was in a while ago. Yeah. They're, but like again i i think they need to learn from the mistakes that zynga made and not uh, just you know like not be yeah, i think the problem with that is that like you think oh wait a minute i am so different from zynga i'm so better from zynga so obviously it cannot happen to me and then the next guy comes in and he's like oh i'm so better than king obviously it cannot happen <laughs> to me and then so on i think the next guy after king will probably be the kicksai guys uh yeah oh. Which one? Kickside. 
So I, What's that? They're another social games, casual games company. Okay. Yeah, they do a lot of uh, mid, well, what's term mid court. I can just know. complete the whole uh, circle. What they should do is they should also trademark King, and then Vilambir has to change the, their name for the third time. Send them this. so that game just keeps on changing names because it's all trademark. And then they just like, go like Vilambir game number five, game number six, and so on. No, no, no. King.com should trademark the word throne because only the king can sit on the throne. And then Nuki <laughs> has to change its name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so, like, in some cases, it's just so weird. It's like. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, weird. especially, like, in video games where, uh, like, in, in general terms, developers have not been. Uh, used used to this whole uh, this this aspect of you know products competing, like in phones for yeah. example, every phone manufacturer has their own innovation thing going, but they also have their own patent lawyers who are on the lookout for. So it's like a multi pronged battle, you know, some like some for sort of cyberpunk shit where it's like it's a it's a tech battle and it's a lawyer battle and it's this battle. <laughs> in game in game development, that hasn't really been the norm. And I think like many people don't want it to stay that way. Like I certainly want it to stay that way. Because these kind of battles inherently favor the, the person with the more money. Like uh, not always. Look at how long that EA versus Tim Landell thing back down in court, right? Yeah, no, but the thing is that EA had way more money than Tim Landell. So that's yeah, why they, 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 they had way more money than Tim Landell, but it it didn't get thrown out immediately. Like if yeah. By, by that, by the logic you're saying, like the, the EA should have won outright within a couple of days by just going. No, no, court. no. That's not it. Actually, it's the opposite. Like what you do is you have certain stalling tactics, because it does. It wouldn't matter. Like even if that case went on for like an year or two, which it did, it 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 was a blip in EA's finances. But that won't be the case for these stoic guys. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like King in this case, like even let's say you have a case that like Stoic is like sure to win. Like you have so much money. But King can just keep on delaying. There are so many like law tactics. That See, but the, the, can... the shitty part is if King wins, right? They'll they'll have to do what Tim Langdell has to do right now. Tim Langdell yeah. has to pay his lawyer fees for wasting the court's time. Yeah, so you do you think really that King would be like, oh my God, now we have to go hungry? Or, no, 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 no. I'm saying, uh, I'm saying that if Stoic loses, they'll have to end up paying King's lawyer yeah. fees. Like they will, yeah. they stand to lose a lot of money. They, yeah, they won't be able to come out of that. Yeah, but and exactly that. That's what makes it uh, like even more daunting. Even if you have a watertight case, you think, what if I lose? Then I will have to. Like, so it's it's just it's loaded in the favor of the party with the more money. You know? uh, so I was I was gonna say let's end it here. Uh, okay. Let's say bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. See you guys. We're signing off. Yeah. This is take care everyone. Like, oh, oh, also just before uh, just before we end, uh, like we've not been regular for the last couple of weeks, but we're gonna start getting regular again from this week. Yeah. Just so all our the 10 people who listen to this so that all of them know we will be like yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be back guys don't worry yeah okay see you guys later